This is the Defenders podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Loki, episode two, The Variant. I'm ten steps ahead of you. I've been playing a game of my own all along. What? Charm your way in front of the timekeepers, hustle them, and seize control of the TVA? Am I getting warm? A double cross by history's most reliable liar. Okay, why are you in there sticking your neck out for me? I'll give you two options, and you can believe whichever one you want. A, because I see a scared little boy shivering in the cold, and you kind of feel bad for that ice runt. Or B, I just want to catch this guy, and I'll tell you whatever I need to tell you. I don't need your sympathy. Good, because I'm running out of it. Hey, nonny, nonny, fellow Defenders, and welcome back to the Defenders podcast on TV Podcast Industries. Uh, yes, we are here talking about Loki, episode two, The Variant. I am one of your jet skiing hosts, John. I'm one of your other hosts, Derek. And rounding out this trio of variants, I am Chris. I have to know why, hey, nonny, nonny, John. Because they went back to a medieval fair in 1985 in Wisconsin. Very good. Uh, Yes, yes. We will obviously be talking spoiler filled uh, about this episode of Loki. Uh, But yes, just quickly that opening scene. Anybody else massively surprised when 1985 came up on screen? Because that looks like a pretty good Renaissance fair, doesn't it? We just don't get them over here. We don't. Or in the UK. Like, it, like America goes, oh, I need to go to Renfair. Like, so many people talk about it. I'm like, you've got the LARPing element and you've got the rest. I'm just like, I want to do it. Over here, you've got a couple of people in cosplay. And then it's just usually in a convention center, if you're lucky. It's the local sports hall. Yeah, or it's people in real life doing things like Morris dancing yes. or yes. Maple dancing <laughs> or any kind of things like that i mean you kind of have reenactment stuff you like do. of battles i guess yeah but that's do. not really where you drink kind of beer and eat cheese it's where you get no. your face like figuratively shot off uh, in the reenactment yes With not literally because that's, that's that's not really a reenactment that's an actual battle if that happens <laughs> uh, enough <laughs> about renaissance fairs uh, let's get into uh, the podcast overall um quickly before we go into it i just want to say that we uh, did have an appearance this week on another podcast all three of us got together and had a chat with the guys over at superhero show show uh, had a conversation about tv podcast industries what we do the shows we've loved to cover the shows that we may not necessarily have loved covering Uh, and it was a really good chat Uh, go over and check out the Superhero Show Show our bits right at the end of their episode Um, this week's episode for Superhero Show Show is massive if you haven't heard them before what they do is cover every single comic book related show every week wow and nowadays that's around 15 to 20 shows Some of them they don't cover in any depth at all because they may not have watched the episodes, but they do discuss every single show that's on every week. So, uh, so we are towards the end of the episode. So if you want to check that out, uh, go check, go over to Superhero Show Show and have a listen. Dare I say it's not scientifically possible, Mulder. It's not possible unless you have about five or six hours available to you every week, uh, which we don't either. So we, we have to choose the shows that we cover. Uh, but it was good fun, uh, talking to Mike, uh, from, from the Superhero Show Show, wasn't it, guys? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, very really much good. so. And just remember to tell them TV Podcast Industry sent you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, one other big announcement uh, for the week. It is June, which means it's Chris Jones's birthday. This week, happy birthday, <laughs> Mr. Chris Jones. <laughs> Thank you very yes. much. Happy birthday, Christoph. Yes, I am a spry 55 years old. <laughs> you don't even sound it or look at Chris, which is important. No, I, I appreciate it. it. It's all the time, the timey wimey uh, jumping. I am yeah. actually a variant of my own variant self. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you look about 49 or something. Not thank you yeah. so much. It, it really it's is. The it's the youthful good looks. And the, the lack of grey in my hair. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Well, we must look 70 then. Uh, since we're well, both speak quite for gray. yourself. Uh, well, no, we... I'm as smooth as a baby's bottle. <laughs> well, we are all celebrating Chris's birthday uh, kind of virtually at the moment. Uh, we're celebrating on the podcast, but hopefully we'll get to meet up and have a couple yes. of drinks with Chris. To don't worry. Well. Yes. Don't worry, Chris. We'll eat your birthday cake. Yes, we will. 
Yes, we will. Um, Appreciate that. I did Thank do you. that for my uh, my niece's uh, 18th birthday. I do, as you remember, <laughs> I know, John, we did. Uh, yeah, I cooked a, a two tier uh, chocolate birthday cake and ate it all uh, between myself in front and of her. in front of her <laughs> on the Zoom call. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, she had to know that I cooked it. It was gorgeous. Or did he? Did you? I did cook it, absolutely. We might do the same thing, Chris, if we're in the mood for uh, eating a massive Brita cake uh, this weekend. (laughs) And I am very much down. I'm down for that. Excellent. Well, I I do like a good old nibble. (laughs) <laughs> well, have a very happy birthday, Chris. Thank you very much, Chad. But with the celebratory uh, birthday wishes for Chris over with, remember, fellow defenders, this is our spoiler-filled discussion of episode two of Loki. Mm-hmm. Remember, if you aren't subscribed, please head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to any uh, magical or mischievous uh, podcast catcher of your choice. You can support us um, through Patreon in regular amounts or for a one-off amount, we are over on buymeacoffee.com slash tvpi. Absolutely. Um, but all support is absolutely great to get and of course you can share the podcast with friends family and i think chris once said grannies uh to to spread the love spread the podcast and share uh our dulcet tones yeah. around the world absolutely always good to share it with everybody i think uh, loki's a, a, a show that everybody will enjoy watching i think as well so definitely yeah. if you have any thoughts on the show or if you want to send chris any happy birthday messages you can email us to feedback <laughs> at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over and join us on the facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries and tag chris and say happy birthday to him thanks <laughs> <laughs> any wishes you can say happy birthday you can say whatever you would like good just morrow, keep it PC happy Halloween whatever you happy like. Halloween yeah. yeah that's a good one yeah <laughs> it's very early for yeah. that but why not yeah sure it's June like you know it's fine Ooh, again timey wimey it could it is out October somewhere somewhere <laughs> well exactly how very very Albert Einstein of you, Chris. Um, Thank you. Looking at us through Zoom with those big nerdy specs on. Great stuff. (laughs) But let's get into some nerdy episode details. Derek, on with the show. Absolutely. Yep. The head writer again for the series is Michael Waldron. Uh, this episode particularly was written by Alyssa Karasek. Uh, Alyssa worked as an assistant to the executive producers on one of your favorite shows, Chris. She worked for you for a very long time over on Bones. Oh, it's so good. Mm-hmm. It, 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 you know when you just have like there's a type of show that just you know after a while it's just it's not good but it's still good and yeah you really enjoy it it's one of those shows. i really do yeah it's it's like castle it's just like after a certain point you're like oh come on just keep going but kill it at the same time <laughs> and that is literally the show that i always get confused with uh i can yes. never never tell the difference between bones and, uh, and castle apart from the uh, the cast of course um, <laughs> uh, kind of helps but Alyssa, obviously in the writer's room for this series and, and working on on this entire show of loki um the episodes all episodes uh, for the series uh, confirmed to be directed by kate heron now uh, that the show is out we were had a question about that last week kate is confirmed as the director of all of the episodes of this series if you want to hear a really good interview with Kate about the process and how she got involved with Loki, uh, go over to the Empire podcast. There's a really good interview, uh, probably about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, just for her talking about how she got the job, how she got involved in the show. She sounds so excited and seems to be so interested in the reaction of how everybody will uh, will see her show. What's quite interesting about it is she's still editing episodes five and six of Loki as of last week. So the show yeah. is not finalized as, as, as we record. I think it's officially finalized now. She's just arrived back in the UK after uh, finishing that process. So, uh, so the show is officially finalized now, but as of last week and when she was recording the, uh, the podcast, she was still editing. So there you go. Excellent stuff. Like us all flying by the seat of her pants. It does sound like my, ed- my kind of editing. <laughs> yeah. John. It's like, oh, it's too late tomorrow. Better yeah. finish. Exactly. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode of Loki? Episode two, The Variant. Sure. A team of Time Variance Authority Minutemen arrive at a Renaissance fair in Wisconsin in 1985. They're on the trail of a Loki variant. But to the tune of holding out for a hero, they are taken out by the hooded figure who captures and kidnaps Hunter C-20. Meanwhile, back at the TVA headquarters, Mobius meets with Judge Renslayer to explain that Loki is a valuable asset that is needed to catch the murderous variant. 
Given one last chance, Loki is tasked with searching through the variant's history to find clues on where it might be. Loki suggests that his variant could be hiding in apocalyptic events throughout the sacred timeline, which would mask any activities, since that timeline will end. To test the theory, Mobius takes Loki to Pompeii, 79 AD. With the impending eruption of Mount Vesuvius, they learn that nothing Loki does shows up as a variant timeline. Using the origin data of the Kabloe candy left behind in France at the variant's previous attack, Loki quickly identifies where they could be hiding. When the team arrives at the Roxcart Superstore in 2050's Alabama, Loki meets his variant where they possess Hunter B-15 and other customers of the store to inform Loki that he has no idea of the scale of their plan. It isn't about him. Finally, revealing their true form to Loki, they set off a chain of time reset charges that are sent throughout time creating hundreds of breakaway moments and causing chaos in the sacred timeline. As the Time Variance Authority m- mobilized to do something about the impending multiversal event, Lady Loki slips away from Alabama through a time door closely followed by Loki, who has escaped his capture. Wow, from 79 AD all the way up to 2050, this is a huge time-spanning, time-jumping episode of uh, of Loki, and I think there's Definitely some connections and moments that felt like Doctor Who to me. It was Just very, like... yeah, very uh, Doctor Who-y. Mm-hmm. Uh, really good, though. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I think the it's only going to continue now. Like They they, they slowly introduce the, the, yeah, the crazy Doctor Who time jumpy levels. Mm-hmm. And in this, they kind of, they, they kind of get, okay, last episode... We'll introduce you to the the understanding and lay the foundations. They'll do two or three now, and I expect by the end of this series, it will be like him jumping through door, 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 oh, right, and you'll, we'll be like a hundred time streams and time zones in a couple of minutes. <laughs> just for obviously I'm being facetious, but you understand what I mean. Absolutely, that will be. It'll be really interesting to see how that goes. But yeah, definitely some little adventures. I think particularly um, the the shorter jumps uh, that they had. Uh, will we kick off into our top five variants. Absolutely, I think we should begin not at the beginning, but in 1985 for the Renaissance Fair and our variant one. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like we have this initial arrival at the fair of C20. Um, it, the agency 20, one of the Minutemen. Um, you know, I do, I have to say, I do like the onlookers who are there, who are all in, in costume and they do stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Um, but they, they, they arrive at the fair because of a, a, a time event, a nexus, the start of a nexus event, mm-hmm. uh, where the variant Loki, uh, has, has come in here. And, um, I guess this really sets up the idea as well of of um, the variant Loki being able to possess other people. Absolutely, it did feel um, very reminiscent of Wanda's power there in terms of being able to mind control, just with a a minty flavor, I guess, with it being green. Um, yeah, like remember when we saw that back in uh, in Age of Ultron, the first time we really saw Scarlet Witch's power, she's kind of tapping people on the temple. She sends out the kind of red gas to show that she's she's controlling their mind. Charming, Here we kind of see yeah. the, the green gas from Loki, exactly as you say, John. So it does feel like it's really connecting back to, hey, remember everybody, Loki's not just a master manipulator or anything like that. He's also got magic involved. He's very yeah. similar to Scarlet Witch. Right? Uh, but it was, th- there is a slight difference, I think, because in, at least in Age of Ultron, she's implanting memories mm-hmm. or ideas. Here, it's more about control, I guess, but it, it's very reminiscent. Like, and I think, um, you know, it, it was, it was nice to see uh, a bit of this because ultimately he is a, a god of mischief mm-hmm. and, and should be able to, to do some of this. I, I, I like the fact as well that when, you know, we have a bit, a little bit later where Mobius, um, it's, in fact, it's just before they go through to sort of deal with this, 
um, this timeline event that's happened at this Renaissance Fair in 1985. Uh, and Mobius kind of runs through Loki's powers and you, we get a really nice little moment of of Loki making this distinction between um, a, a projection and him replicating himself mm -hmm. and, and all that. So, like, we know he's got those different powers, but this, I think, was a new one for me, actually, at least from the, the movies, yeah. So our Loki, the Loki we know that the throughout time and through the MCU has not had this power. It's like a charm power, very a lot of within the comic books, Enchantress would be the main kind of Asgardian kind of sorcery one who does a lot of the charm. In the MCU, Loki was able to control people using the scepter, which was the Mind Stone. Um, that was his how he to date, had this kind of charm control powers. So what we're seeing here is that this variant Loki has a different subset of powers. Maybe similar or more expanded. Maybe they are more powerful than the Loki we are aware of. The Loki that we know. Well, as of right now, they do not have that power. Right. Right. I'd see in, in the MCU, I think we probably would always think as the first big introduction is Scarlet Witch to magic. Mm. And, and even at the time, we were kind of thinking she was experimented on. It's not really magic. And then Doctor Strange came in and he's now the magic user. So that was all about explaining what magic is in the MCU. And now when you're trying to kind of line all these characters up together to come into the Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, I think it's a really good way of doing it to kind of show just this idea of magic a bit more in those characters that are going to be connected together. So uh, so I think at the MCU, they were kind of resistant to making Loki being a magic user uh, in their universe, but certainly in the comics, he has multiple powers that come out in different ways. Well, so I think it was quite a good way to do it in here, just to show the little connection that they're similar in power sets. And it might just be the variant that has that power. It may not be the Loki from 2012 that we're following throughout the show, but uh, but I think it was a good little touch to show that. And of course, one of the variants of, of Loki in you know, the potential for multiverse could be Loki Sorcerer Supreme, mm -hmm. like from the yeah. comics. So totally like Loki uh, has that m magical ability. Um, so, you know, I think this makes sense to me that this, yeah. the variant Loki here would be using this, this magic, um, in, in a way and uh, using it on C20, who ultimately then she, takes control of and kidnaps so yeah. we have that she becomes missing in action once they have you know reset the timeline with the reset devices and exactly. um, variant loki takes another one so these yeah. whatever uh, the variant is doing these you know again it's just being flagged as we see towards the end of the episode the importance of these devices being taken by the variant exactly so just wanted to kind of very quickly call that uh, Sasha Lane, fantastic. Hope we see more of her as C20 because mm -hmm. uh, she's in Utopia, right. um, which very good comic book based or mm -hmm. adjacent, if you want to call it that. Um, good show based in the American version, not the original British right. version. This yeah. is an American remake. I've only seen very, the very good. version. I've never seen the, the American version, unfortunately. Yeah, the, the American version, quite good. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about Loki as a whole is this is very much a magic based one, but the original timeline for the MCU Disney Plus shows was Captain America, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, then One Division and followed pretty quickly by Loki. Mm -hmm. We got the, the, the flip of that to a degree. So you were going to have these two very magic centric shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, being aired very close together. Yeah. Um. So they 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 they're doing it with the understanding that you probably just come off or just aware of some of the kind of magic elements. Now that we're aware that magic is a real thing in the MCU. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Yeah, yeah, good good point to make it. But I suppose it's not that far in history with One Division. Yes. So and, and and we know now that everybody who had a Disney Plus subscription was definitely watching One Division when it came out. So, uh, so they're probably a good bet that uh, that people know that from from for Loki. I think the other good thing about this whole scene in the Renaissance Fair, not only um, you know the initial bit where we see the variant, but it, it's the it's the investigation. Uh, of what's happened there is you, you see that first interaction of, of, um, 
the the sacred Loki, I guess, or as he is describing himself in this in in this episode as the superior Loki, yeah. um, which I really like. I, I love that his ego is is so bad that he has to inflate it with adding the 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 superlative of of, of superior. Mm-hmm. Of course, um, exactly. And but we, you know we we have this nice little, little interaction in the field between um, Mobius and Loki, where it, you know it looks like he's trying to help. Is he playing for time to for him to escape? Is he playing for time because he is a god and he maybe knows something a bit more than he's letting on so far? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know he, he's using the tale um, of the wolf's ears and the wolf's teeth, and you know you do get that sense as well that Mobius has you know at least some measure of Loki because he, he's there going no no. He's, he's playing for time here. Yeah, yeah. Um, set the devices, you know, before it hits the Nexus uh, threshold for it going into chaos. So, you know, the, there's some really nice interactions throughout this episode between Mobius and uh, and Loki. Yeah, another as well. another big shout out to the to the interaction between Owen Wilson and, and Tom Hiddleston. I love the two characters together. I love how they're how they're working together. It's re- it really worked well. Yeah, but to move on to variant two i guess it's almost his punishment or his detention it's like he got a hundred lines uh <laughs> from uh from mobius because of that little trick that he was trying to play at the renaissance fair is mm-hmm. you know we come to loki's mission uh where he's having to do a lot of uh research and delving into the archives of uh, the tva to find out were the variant maybe hiding? Is there something that the TVA uh, has missed? Mm-hmm. I do think, you know, again, this is really strong where you have Mobius and Loki interacting. Um, you know, the, the, and the fact that he's kind of been blocked, you know, he's wanting to get archives around the timekeepers yeah. or the beginning of time and you've kind of got you know the the, the classic deadpan librarian uh not willing to to take any yeah. messing from him um, and like you know with loki th- this kind of stuff comes really easy for him everywhere he's gone and everywhere he's traveled he tends to be able to get whatever he wants basically so this must be so frustrating to loki where he just walks up to a librarian who has loads of files available to her and she says no to him. You know, this idea where he's going, give me the history of the TVA. No. How about the start of time? How about the end of time? <laughs> no, you're not authorized to any of those things. What are you authorized for? The file marked Loki Laufison. That's it. That's the only file you're able to access. And that's how he's he kind of has to go into this uh, this process of a job for Loki. He's yeah. effectively working for the first time as well. So, uh, so, but I, I, I like this idea that he goes, he goes through it and comes up with a, a concept, comes up with a, a way that this variant of himself could be hiding throughout, uh, throughout time. Yeah. Well, he has got his special TVA uniform now, um, mm-hmm. assigned with, you know, a bit of a, a running gag from the other Minutemen and also, I guess, a warning so that they never forget that he is also a variant. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean. I'm well, presuming this jacket is going to be worn by a lot of people at, at Comic Cons and at, uh, at, at Halloween. Uh, I guess for, so. Uh, for time memorial. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Homer once famously said, you don't make friends with salad. Uh, by Homer, I do mean Homer Simpson, of course. Um, and except where it is making friends with a salad metaphor, mm. um, which was just, um, dare I say it, Chris, to, to pinch one of your phrases, chef's kiss as well, just to keep <laughs> the, the food analogy going. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to check this. How does this work? Because this is quite a complicated episode. Um, I think there's a lot of timeline stuff that's going on here and a lot of, a lot of real theory that they're getting into. How did this metaphor work? Like, I think Tom Hiddleston, Loki says it himself. He's like, that I kind of, kind of fell apart about halfway through the metaphor, but <laughs> it's quite important to understand what he's talking about. Basically, if the timeline is this thing, is this salad bowl, I can do whatever I want to because the entire salad bowl is going to get destroyed in the future. I can do anything in the salad bowl that I want to do because this is going to be destroyed completely in the future. That's the metaphor he's trying to go for. What do you think, Chris? What do you think of how that worked as a metaphor? I loved it myself. In saying, I was going to say it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to understand as you get further into the episode, as they go to Pompeii, mm-hmm. as they kind of show it off in the aspect of this event is going to happen. So anything that happens 
in and around that event, no matter what happens, is fine because every living thing that will or potentially remember anything in that period of time will no longer exist. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, makes sense. Like, if you think of it like that. Though, pretty sure one or two people escape Pompeii. Probably, <laughs> like, like, those goats escaped Pompeii. But I, I suppose what he's saying is they don't create branch timelines. That's the, that's the yes. test that they have. Like, there's a, there is a really weird one where he complicates it by saying, I could go to Ragnarok and I could push Hulk off the Rainbow Bridge, which happens, I think, to Hulk. I think Hulk does actually fall off the bridge in Ragnarok, but you're kind of going, but Hulk survives that. Hulk gets away from there. So he'd be able to tell the story of this weird Loki that appeared out of nowhere and pushed me off the side. So that would be a branching timeline. Is it? Well, that's what, hap- that's what I'm yes. thinking of. So suddenly it started to get more complicated. And then that's when he calls it out and goes, maybe that analogy wasn't the greatest one. But by putting this into the episode, laying it out that way, and then doing the trip to Pompeii as well, putting those two things together, I think you get the idea of what he's trying to say that there's, it's such a massive event that something so small happening, like like another variant of Loki walking in and using it as their base in time, would go unnoticed effectively. So I, I do like that yeah, as the exactly. overarching explanation. Exactly, and I think um, you know that that's the whole point. I think when they're trawling through different apocalyptic events, some of them, you know, I think Mobius says everyone has to be wiped out. It's not everyone in the world as such, mm-hmm. but like they talk yeah. about the Krakatoa event where it's the wipeout of that island it's the wipeout of or the extinction of swallows Mm -hmm. which has effects on the whole um uh the the whole ecological pyramid Mm -hmm. so so, you know it's an interspecies apocalyptic event i guess and and all of that kind of stuff so i thought the analogy was really good and i think what it also did was just as I say, it, it, it's those exchanges between yeah. Tom Hiddleston and Owen Wilson um, as Loki and Mobius are just so, so good. Because, I mean, Owen Wilson's face as he's pouring, you know, he's just chucking tons of salt and pepper onto his salad, which is his lunch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then finally drowning it in in water or some liquid that he, he's taken from another table was just just really, really good. That's and poor Casey again. Yeah, it was poor involved. Casey. Yeah. And then just, you know, the way Tom Hiddleston is just, like, he does that open arm gesture. He mm-hmm. does it a few times. And he, he did it at Pompeii. And again, you know, this whole analogy takes them to Pompeii, where again, they have this this great sort of moment um, where he's speaking Latin, he's releasing the goats, um, he <laughs> and then he erupts. And I love the fact that he's like, look, aren't I brilliant? As mm. you know, the theory has been validated by Mobius, and um, there's just this pyroclastic sort of cloud of hot ash racing down the 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 volcano um, mm-hmm. to effectively kill everyone uh, in the vicinity. It's the um, fact that he's in no rush you know. to get out of there as well as the, <laughs> and he's got a big grin on his face. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our word of today for uh, for uh, geography enthusiast is pyroclastic. Thanks, John. No worries. Um, <laughs> we can have a podcast on volcanology, I guess. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. Uh, anything else on on the uh, on the mission, Chris? Yeah, just a final piece was it comes down to the, the this measurement of the variance in the timeline from these events, and that's where how like no matter what happens, the, the this variance doesn't get big enough because this number doesn't grow because of the 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 apocalypse so what i'm interested to see is does that come out again later which is is there like they're measuring whatever happens in the future this is like there's this scene where loki's getting too close to it becoming a branching timeline and you'll see Mobius with a kind of look, reading the measurement device going, you're getting too close, man. It's going to be a branching timeline, man. He's like, no, don't worry. We're getting it fine. Like, wow. it's that kind of <laughs> silly play. Maybe, yeah. I, I don't know whether it ever gets, like, it, it doesn't even start a branching timeline because once the branching timeline has started, it's begun effectively. So that's that's the point. This timeline staying absolutely exactly as seen in the sacred timeline inverted in uh, inverted commas and we'll get to that (laughs) yeah 
One final thing, yeah, just about about the discussions that are going on here in the canteen uh, with uh, Mobius and Loki is they have a quite a deep conversation, really, about the nature of things and the purpose of all life, and it's kind of buried in here in all these conversations. I just wanted to have a quick chat about it because I really like this discussion, this idea that you know Mobius is telling the story of the TVA and how it's created. You know, it's brought about by these three aliens, effectively, who are trying to create the sacred timeline, and right now they're unwinding timelines. Um, to make sure they get to its natural end. And once it ends, that's the end of everything. And we all meet together in this glorious final ending. And Loki goes, do you not realize how weird that sounds? And then I love Mobius throwing that back in Loki's face going, well, how were you created? It's like, well, a frost giant. And then my, my adopted father was Odin um, of Asgard. And it's like, that does sound a bit weird, doesn't it? And I love the, the conversation. It's quite a, d- a deep conversation because effectively, they're putting it on every religion. Everybody who believes that there is a creation story involved in their religion or any kind of creation story, really, it all is a bit weird when you think about it. Everything from having the Big Bang creating the universe to having a god that put everybody on Earth, all of it sounds really weird when taken in abstract. Um, so I love that they've had this conversation on the show. I agree. I think that's what they were trying to call out, not so subtly, um, in that... Yeah, whether you believe in a man being pulled by a giant hammer or you believe in a man being crucified for your sins and rising again. Um, it's, or you believe particles, two particles smashed together and created a whole universe. All of them can be true. None of them can be true. But they all sound weird to everyone who doesn't believe in that other thing. Yeah. Um, it's fun. It's a nice poke at belief in general. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to be more to it than that. Yeah, and I think Loki calls out part of his perspective as well. This idea that that's not really what he cares about. What he cares about is this central concept that he has, which is no one is ever truly bad. No one is ever truly good. Um, something that he's been painted with quite a lot. He's seen as the bad guy. He is the villain of Marvel's first big movie. So here he's trying to say, I'm a complex person. And I know the people that you treat as heroes aren't necessarily only good because one of them is his brother, Thor. So he's trying to kind of call that out that there are complexities. And I think that's just a kind of a meta commentary on some of the older villains, maybe of the Marvel movies who really were just villainous um, and didn't really have much extra depth to them. They've gotten much oh, better. Red Skull. Oh, Red Skull. <laughs> <laughs> They've gotten much better over the years. Red Skull was basically just Hitler with a red face, Chris. So that's that was almost realistic in comparison to some of the other villains. Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, I think it's a, kind of a meta comment saying, we are. yes, we know Loki's a villain. He's got his own TV show. It's going to start getting complex from now on. You can't just call him a villain. You're going to have to call him a complex character from now on. So uh, I did. I, I like that little element to it as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I loved, I loved these exchanges as well. Um, again, it's just, I think this is a real strong part of this episode is these two interacting and, um, you know, the, the, it's just really nice because it's, it's still playing on all of Loki's sort of big ups for himself, mm-hmm. you know, um, his, his ego, um, whether he can be believed and, and Mobius, as I said before, having this kind of measure of him to some extent, yeah. um, which is really nice. And, you know, you have this conversation where they talk about where they're from, but ultimately say, you know, it's all ludicrous. Effectively, it's all chaos and we all try and put some kind of sense on the chaos. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what this is um i think it, it's just really nice and of course it all leads as well as part of um this you know following their field trip to to um vesuvius and to pompeii um it, it does lead to you know suddenly having another variable uh, with which to try and track the variant loki uh, by the very nature of they now know that they have um apocalypses that they need to look for apocalypses Mm -hmm. but in this conversation you have the kablooey candy or chewing gum uh, from the first episode that was being eaten by the the boy in the church in france Mm -hmm. and that this was only manufactured within a certain period and so 
that now these dependent variables on the sort of the independent variable that is and um, the Loki variant uh, moving through time and, and space yeah. the, to to be able to pinpoint yeah. them um at a certain apocalyptic event at a time where you had kablooey candy yeah. so again it's it, it's it's kind of nice the way they feed off one another and of course in in this instance it progresses that um that the 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 arc of this episode and again you have loki after being complimented by um by mobius saying you are a clever man and he goes of course and does his big grin <laughs> which is great tom hiddleston just does that so well mm-hmm. he does he does really does uh, let's get on to variant three uh our third big point of the episode uh, one that i want to talk about really was just a little bit about the lives of the tva employees because there's kind of references going on we don't know anything about this group before the first episode of this season really and there's just little kind of drops that are in here something about i think owen wilson uh eating that salad and having it taken off and you mentioned his reaction to loki throwing the salt and pepper on it, it makes me think that he is that that's not a canteen that that the food's provided for you it feels like he's buying his own food in there like he feels like he's an absolute standard office worker who's it really a pains to lose his salad. He's not getting it for free. He doesn't work for Google or anything, you know. Um, but there's just a couple of little references that I wanted to kind of call out in here. Um, because Loki mentions it. He says that the TVA is in the future. It looks kind of futuristic, doesn't it? It seems kind of futuristic. And he gets no answer from Mobius at all to it being futuristic. If you think about, you know, the technology is very futuristic to us, of course, but they have aliens involved. Um so the technology of traveling through time is very futuristic, I suppose. Uh, but the technology of the screens that they're using seems like something set in the 50s, seems like something from the Jetsons, a possible, it looks kind of like the future maybe, but isn't. Um, because we know things are vastly different than that now. Every piece of research they're doing is all paper based. It's all paper files. They're not, they're not using computers to search up this stuff. They're going through stacks and stacks of data on paper, not through computers. So there's quite significant things in here that tells you that it may not be in the future. But one of the weirder things that I'm noticing with the characters in in the employees of the TVA, it started out last episode with Casey, that processing clerk, um, having no idea what a fish was, for example. Um, Mobius mentioning his obsession with 1990s jet skis, but never having been on one, because wouldn't it be weird to have a TVA employee on a jet ski? Well, how would anybody know that he's a TVA employee if he goes on a jet ski? He's just a normal human guy, seemingly, right? We have Judge Renslayer who's saying that she collects all these trinkets and you see Mobius in the conversation getting really jealous of the fact that she's got all these me- mementos from all of these different time periods and all the world outside, really, of the TVA. So yeah. it seems like all of these people are almost like slaves in this area. Well, maybe not slaves, but people who are born and bred for this job in the TVA and they've never seen the outside world other than their missions. Anybody else got any weird vibes off the TVA? Yeah, I mean, you you get the whole, um, you know, Loki, you know, he's been trained up to be this employee. He talks about, you know, the propaganda of the TVA being exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one side of things and just how, you know, when Mobius is describing all these things, he says, and, and even just the you know, how boring it sounds. Um, and so there's that yeah, element. You even make the apocalypse sound boring. Yeah, so, you apocalypse. know, it, it, it is that kind of outsider being able to look into what's happening within the TVA. You know, they've all got their kind of, their, their functions and their cubicle to sit in. I mean, it is very kind of that idea of the great bureaucracy, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, it, it really fits that. And so, yes, that idea of something not being quite right with, um, the, the TV, TVA employees. I mean, we have the whole thing about whether it's only Loki and Mobius that actually have the free will, um, in, in the whole of the, uh, the TVA. Mm-hmm. And I think I mentioned it last week about the idea of, you know, the, the free will at, around sort of con- confidence intervals. Uh, you know, how far do they extend until the timekeepers go? It's a, de- it's a variant. It's a deviation yeah. from the sacred timeline. So, um, it, 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 it's all these things are suggestive 
you know, now that they've, they've built on them again in episode two, the, yeah, I think there's more to come from the TVA mm. uh, to find out, you know, its role and I guess the timekeepers because both Loki and the Loki variant have the timekeepers in their sights by the, the looks of it. Well, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to recuse myself uh, based on comic book knowledge um, in terms of I think I know some things. I know what you're asking in the comic books okay. based on the comic books. So it may be completely different, but I don't want to say something that may ruin a big Absolutely. nice reveal for everyone in the future. Um, so I'll recuse myself from that. One thing, in terms of the aesthetic and the time, mm-hmm. it very much reminds me of the so there's a, a series of games called uh, Fallout uh, like by Bethesda yeah, Game yeah. Studios, so it's that kind of kitschy fifties future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of Jetsons. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's retro like, sci-fi. It is in the future, vibe. but at yeah. the same, it's retro futuristic. Yeah. yeah, it's that kind of very kish kind of look and feel. So that's they're still on paper, but they use computer screens and they've got a uh, like Miss Time came out of the computer. And was a hologram, uh, and then jumped back into the computer. So it's all this very cool. My Miss assumption Miss is minutes. it Miss Minutes, excuse me, yeah. Miss Minutes <laughs> jumped out of time and back. Sorry, jumps out of the computer back in. Mm-hmm. So I, I get the feeling it's a bit like Asgard. It looks high tech, futuristic technology, but it's designed to look a different way. Mm. So in Asgard, it looks like magic. Um, in um, the, the TVA, it looks like retro sci-fi. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say is probably they are also because they're somewhat out of time in the quantum verse. So my assumption is they are in the quantum verse. They're outside yeah. of time and space in the yeah. quantum realm. And that is just based on looking at kind of the, the, when they did that big shot of, um, the, the kind of cityscape. The city, yeah. 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 Um, looking at the kind of, if you look beyond the buildings, the look of the actual background, the, the actual sky, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, the horizon, looks like something that um, when they did Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it almost looks like there is no horizon or, 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 or skyline. Yeah. Um, it, it almost feels like it's a close-up, yet it's showing this huge cityscape of the TVA. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely with you there on on it potentially being in the quantum realm. Yeah, I think um, we even had some feedback on, yeah. our, on our feedback episode that, that mentioned that it could be something in the in the quantum realm yeah. as well. Uh, one other tiny thing, uh, once again, there are three aliens at the center of this plan for the sacred timeline, and everybody we've met in the TVA is human, apart from Miss Minutes, arguably, because she's not human, she's a cartoon. Um so yeah, are are the humans doing the work for uh, for the um, for the aliens, or do they just have a branch of the TVA on every single planet? And these TVA agents are only working on Earth. Loads to learn about the TVA. Just want to make sure that we're all uh, that we're all kind of on the same page of the kind of weird stuff that's going on with them. So because uh, is this V? More. Is this the new V? <laughs> exactly. It might, be. it might be. It's when they start to eat hamsters that'll be the problem. <laughs> Uh, let's get on to the big showdown in variant number four. I think uh, time to get on there, yeah? Let's do it. Yes, let's all head off to Alabama, to Rock's Cart, um, which I still, m- my wife did turn around to me and go, is that a real thing? I'm like, no. No. It's based on, it's the <laughs> MCU. It's their version of, their version of. It's a subsidiary of Roxxon. Walmart. Most yeah, likely. It is, exactly. It's exactly. a subsidiary of, and it actually is in the comic books. Rock's card is in the comic. Interesting, interesting. Because I do want to know if it, if it is actually connected to Roxxon, because Roxxon is mm. the was the entity used in every single one of the ABC Marvel <laughs> TV shows. They were always the villain in all of the shows from yeah. um, from Agents of Shield and and I think even Agent Carter had a mention of Roxxon in there. But all the way up to Runaways, all those uh, Marvel TV shows have had mentions of Roxxon. And they've gone for a rock's cart uh, in here. So I was wondering, was it a connection or was it, was it just them kind of going, we can't use rocks on again. We'll slightly change the name. So good to know that it's in the yeah. comics. It's the Walmart exactly. uh, subsidiary of rocks on. And Very surprisingly, good. good information. Why the reason they went for rocks on is because 
Os- Oscorp is usually used as that in the comic books, exactly. and they can't use Oscorp because that is owned by the Sony universe aspect of the Marvel universe. Very good. Uh, very so good. Oscorp is uh, connected to Spider-Man. Yes. Yeah. 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 I like that. And um, yeah, so it's they all show up in Alabama, twenty fifty, uh, to this uh, class ten apocalyptic event. I do like how nonchalant they were in turning up at a class 10 uh, apocalyptic event. And I loved how Mobius looked like he had just been uh, bird watching or spotting trains with his like anorak on. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I just, he was just preparing for the rain. I know, but it was just like, you know, there's, there's the, the, the hurricane type winds. There's Mm -hmm. the, the downpour you see you know the the wide pan shot with the waves crashing up against obviously coming into flood and i just i thought mobius really did look like um a civil servant arriving (laughs) at a a a massive um you know crisis or um or tragic kind of um yeah apocalyptic event Mm -hmm. yeah I loved it. I loved Loki just using his powers to dry himself off. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it was just like prestidigitation. Da da! <laughs> um, any of our D&D listeners or players will know that as a joke. It is a spell used by Wizards called prestidigitation. Very Done. good. I'm all clean. <laughs> Very good. Anyway. I do, I love it and I love that he does have a real reason for it. It's not just about him getting himself dry. It is about the fact that Everybody else is going to alert themselves to their presence by their uh, by their sloppy shoes as they walk around the uh, the department store, <laughs> the wet shoes uh, as they walk around. So he's not going to announce himself as he goes in there. I really love this idea of them walking into this apocalypse and not being able to really disturb it or not. I suppose, as we've learned earlier on, even if they do disturb it, nothing will be saved effectively. So they the members of the team, the Minutemen, how they treat the people that are around them. These really scared people who are hiding out in this massive warehouse and they're just ignoring them, basically, because, well, they're going to die anyway. They might as well get yeah. used to it. It's And I love that it's Mobius is going, hang on a second, there's still people at the end of the day. They might be about to die in 20 seconds, but, um, you know. The, the thing, with, with I, I, absolutely. But the thing I loved about this was, and because before you knew that it were the 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 guy who was searching for half price uh, mm-hmm. plants, before you realized that he was controlled by the variant Loki, I was there going... That's really odd, but I believe that it could happen that <laughs> in the middle of um, some kind of really massive um, sort of environmental hazard and, and you know weather event mm-hmm. that someone is still thinking about the bargain. I, I guess, um, and you know, so, getting in those rocks cart vouchers uh, on the fifty percent, so yeah. that you know they're they're doubling their their return. It's a hurricane um, sale. It's at least fifty percent. I thought off. it was you really know? good, and like, then when it it was oh, it's the variant Loki. Uh, you know, has possessed their body um, yeah. or mind at least. Then um, I was like, okay, that makes more sense. I like how uncertain our Loki is, though. <laughs> when Hunter B fifteen asks him. You know, could this be you? And he's like, I could be, as in, it could, I could be anybody, basically. I could take control of anybody. Uh, you know, guys, I did live in Carolina in, uh, in the US, uh, North Carolina for a number of years, and we have hurricane se- season every year. My family still live out there. Um, genuinely, you don't really know how strong a hurricane's actually going to be until it lands. And you're told so often that a hurricane is going to be a massive hurricane. So, it does wear on you. It's kind of a little bit like the boy cry wolf for a lot of residents of these hurricane zone so i've seen people who will just sit on their porch and watch a hurricane come to land on uh land of the town drink a few beers and have the day off work they they might you know nail up a few boards to make sure their windows don't crash but or smash but um it's not unheard of that you would you would be taken by surprise about the severity of a hurricane so to see this guy shopping for plants in in a class 10 uh hurricane is it, it didn't come as a massive surprise, as you say. So, uh, so I can kind of see the, the, that there would be a bit of confusion from Loki. This might not be me because that's plausible. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. I just have to say, even when it's at its most complex, this show, the, I, I kind of the, give the head writer and the rest of the writers for this just kind of, they're able to inject that 
humor mm-hmm. into it. In like that, yeah, like this is an apocalyptic event. Ah, here's potentially a guy shopping for kind of plants. And you're like, yeah, that could, but could potentially happen. It's absurd, but it could potentially happen. Mm-hmm. It's just fun overall. Yeah, definitely. And I think actually this whole sequence then of the variant Loki jumping between uh, different people uh, until you get to to Randy, it was just really nicely done. I mean, having uh, B-15 being controlled by by the variant Loki, then it, you know, because just it it made the, the spiciness of that language between the two just even better because we know if Hunter B-15 looked back at the tape or, or some footage of this, you'd be probably have the same kind of views as variant Loki, which, you know, holding this other Loki in a bit of disdain, really. Yeah. I mean, she's really not got an awful lot of time for him. And, you know, she's just letting his sort of ego just wash over her. I mm-hmm. mean, she's on a clear mission and she knows what she's wanting to do and you can see loki it's just his the way he's scrambling the way he's still trying to sort of dominate uh this variant um in terms of i'm the more superior you know Mm -hmm. i need you as a lieutenant because i'm going to find the timekeepers and overthrow the tva yeah um huge uh appreciation for uh william osaka here uh her performance as Hunter Bay 15, controlled by Loki, where she does the Tom Hiddleston Loki smile back at Loki <laughs> yeah. as he's doing the smile is fantastic. I would say when Musako on set was practicing that for ages just to get it exactly right. You can tell she's really enjoying uh, playing off uh, Tom Hiddleston there yeah. as well. Yeah. You've got the big butch guy who's, you know, I guess controlled so you can rough up Loki a, a little yep. bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and ju- like he was great. Just some of his expressions, his size, uh, everything mm-hmm. was really good with that. Uh, just flinging uh, Loki around. So uh, I thought this whole sequence was really good and just how it, you know, flashing occasionally back to the other uh members of the TVA team you know where they find C20 uh in in the big sort of security room for yeah. the supermarket um and uh you know we we get this this is where we understand at least i thought um that this variant is also uh, has some mission for uh, you know to find the timekeepers uh, as she she says she's given away the actual location um and i you know this is this was really nicely done i thought and just the different lighting effects yeah. as well in you know a supermarket where the power keeps getting intermittently cut from mm-hmm. the oncoming apocalyptic weather yeah. like so good what do you think she means by it's real, it's real, it's real, it's real? I took it as that, that the threat had been held over, that she was going to do what she does at the end of the episode. The other Loki is going to do what, what they've been saying um, to C20, um, that it's real, it's actually happening. And that's when she reveals that because of this threat, she gave away the actual location of the timekeepers to Loki. Okay. So that's what I thought it meant because she's repeating it over and over again. Um, I, I, that's, that's the only thing I could think of that that's, she's going, Oh no, not only have I given away the timekeepers, she's also about to do the thing, uh, and blow up the timeline effect. Yeah. It, it just felt weird to me. It's real. I, mm-hmm. I was wondering if there's more to it than that that we'll yeah. find out in the next episode. Yeah. I, because yes, the, 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 the 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 threat was very much real, um. But it's just it's a, a strange choice mm-hmm. of words yeah. for that. No, I I thought so too. I, it was kind of because yeah, it just then it didn't really connect with when she says that she's given away the location of the timekeepers. Mm-hmm. But it, it could just I think as Derek said, it could just be she says she, she, that she's going after the timekeepers. I mean, like any good evil Machiavellian type uh, protagonist or antagonist, uh, they always give away their master plan as to how they're going to achieve it. So you could imagine variant Loki sat, sat down on the chair, sort of just laying out the full grand plan of, of what they're going to do. But is it even variant Loki? Let's, 
Go on to the last point yes. there. Um, the variant reveals themselves. This is the episode. Is it even variant Loki? We know for the first episode that's what they're looking for. And we, we come up here and we have a female version of Loki with the uh, the horns and the full Loki-type costume. But the first kind of weird moment of that is when they're having their back-and-forth battle between, let's say, our Loki and uh, the possessed um, Randy is, I think, yep. the, yeah. the uh, shop worker who came, comes to try and help and becomes uh, this Loki. But our Loki calls the other one Loki and is told, no, don't dare call me by that name. Call me by. And they look down at the tag and say, call me by Randy, basically. So, um, so is it Loki at all? Or is it someone that's possessed another variant of Loki? Is it somebody else in another variant of Loki's body? Is that, is that's what's going on here? It just struck me as when they instantly say, do not call me Loki, it sounds like it's someone completely different in here still, even though it's been revealed as a Loki. Yeah, I see where you're going. It, it, it very much could be that. Uh, there's precedent for Lady Loki mm-hmm. um, in the comic books. There's precedence for other Lokis who do not like being called Loki mm-hmm. um, in the comic books. We, we've we known from pressers and the kind of junkets that they've done that they haven't directly pulled the storyline at all from any, uh, but much like WandaVision and uh, Falcon and Children, they've taken aspects from multiple different comic book exactly. kind, of, kind of inspiration. So they could very much like what they did in Falcon and Soldier, taking previous characters played with them, merged with them, updated them, mm-hmm. etc. So it could be a different Loki, uh, or it could be something else entirely. Um, I suppose time, time will tell. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and if not, we can go backwards or forwards so that it will tell. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I know. I, I think I was very happy with the reveal mm-hmm. because it, yeah. it is a fun take yeah. If you will. Yeah. And it's not just Tom Hiddleston, a uh, slightly older or slightly different version of him with his hood down. It's a, it's a completely new actor playing the role. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting to see how it play. Yeah. And I love that there's a reveal and we'll probably talk about it in notes a little bit, but I love that there's a reveal of how many different versions of Loki have straight off the path. We talked about it last week on the first episode that, um, Mobius lied to Loki, the fir- our Loki, the first time he spoke to him. He said, ah, you never stray from the path at all you just go along the path that has been prescribed for you this episode he's saying we've got thousands of lokis going off the path and we have to yeah. have to um cut those branches over and over again so i love that there's a bit of that in there as well yeah no i i love this the lady loki reveal um and the whole showing all the different holograms of, of the different lokis and um, before uh, they they go on their you know what one of their missions um but it it's really good and again just that interchange between the two of them um i i like the idea that she could be potentially possessed in some way or controlled mm-hmm. herself um certainly yeah i guess they wouldn't show it but it didn't feel like that so i mean at the moment i guess i'm thinking it is lady loki um, but I, I love this idea of all the different Lokis, you know, what kind of standard deviation are they away from the, the sacred timeline? Uh-huh. And how, you know, in terms of how they progress or change and to what extent. Yeah. And um, so th- this was really, really good. Um, for me, I love the reveal here. And when she sets her plan in action, I just thought that. I oh. loved how all the reset devices just lit, and I love that overhead, uh, seeing them all light up uh, and then disappear to effectively bring chaos to the sacred timeline. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's an interesting choice where they're all kind of bathed in red lighting then, uh, as that's all kicking off yeah. um, before the variant leaves through one of the time doors uh, to to escape uh, after completing what she wanted to do. Yeah, followed by Loki really quickly afterwards. Um, and the rest of the TVA don't get there in time. So Loki's now traveled to the same place, effectively, as variant yeah. Loki. So they'll be having their showdown, I presume, at the beginning of next episode. They'll be in the same location. But but yeah, that, that, that master plan being revealed, I think that's such a cool thing that moment with the with the uh the reset charges falling through the time doors because you can see them all starting to be set off 
but I just didn't realize they were all also sitting on a pad that was putting them through a time door. So they weren't yeah. just stealing reset charges that the the very Loki traveling through time, meeting up with all the TV ag- agents. It was also cha- also stealing um, these ability to create a time door and, and send it to different parts of um, the timeline, effectively to to create something that's completely insurmountable for the TVA to deal with. So it kind of cuts back to TVA headquarters as all of their operators are going crazy because you can sort out one or two changes in timeline, but as all of these are created at the same time, will they be able to get them sorted out and back to this sacred timeline? Yeah, um, and some of, and some of them seem to be approaching the Nexus line quite quickly, actually. Yeah. like So th- there wasn't much time there. Well, the um, charge wipes out everything in its radius. Yeah. So, uh, so you'd presume I, Variant Loki has chosen the specific location for all of these to go off. Yeah, um, m- must have. And m- maybe it is to, you know, clear the TVA uh, building. Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. I-, I do like as well that I guess Lady Loki doesn't know that uh, Loki Laufersen is going to be joining her because, I mean, she definitely gives him a wave to say later, mm-hmm. like, um, I'm off. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she's not kind of doing the finger wag to Absolutely. pull him in to ask him to join her. So uh, I guess she's going to be a little surprised, um, you know, when she sees him coming through that time door. Absolutely. So you're creating these many factors. Is it literally just to draw the attention of the whole TVA, get everyone out of the TVA office on the assumption that the timekeepers are in the central tower so that they can get to there? Well, she knows exactly where they are. We we don't. Yes, no. But she yes, knows exactly. exactly where they are. Um, yeah. So that could be that could be what she's doing. Um, it feels like she's absolutely going to tr- destroy this sacred timeline. So uh, she is a variant. So she's been pulled from whatever the main timeline is and has escaped somehow. Um, but if the sacred timeline were to exist, she wouldn't. Is what it seems like, right? Is that, is that my interpretation correctly? If the sacred timeline I, exists, yeah. she can't exist, and our Loki can't exist. The one that we're following in the show also can't exist. So, yeah. Um. So what she's trying to do is cre- either potentially break the sacred timeline for her benefit, so she can stay alive. Or you're right, maybe there's maybe she's just pulling the TVA agents, the Minutemen, away from that central building to get at the, the time. Keepers. Yeah. And it's the same idea we were talking about for Loki um, from the first episode that, mm-hmm. you know, he now knows that he's dead in the sacred timeline mm-hmm. and a little later, you know, and he, 10 more years. Of life yeah. But he, he <laughs> also says, Hey, you know, about, I want assurances that I won't be um, processed and wiped effectively mm-hmm. uh, because yes, they could put him back, into the timeline, I guess, from when he escaped, but he knows uh, the inevitability uh, of Thanos and what's going to happen there. To cap him back. No, but that's yeah. what I mean. So, like, that's what we thought from last week was he would, this is what he would be doing to try and maintain his life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That he will, in effect, do what she's doing um, in, in some way, not in this way as such, but you know, try and escape TVA um, at least to try and remain alive yeah. Yeah. and yeah. to jump through time and space. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, massive reveal of a, of a plan that right in that last couple of minutes of the episode, so everything gets a bit chaotic as well. So uh, definitely going to find out more about what exactly is going on at the start of next week's episode. Anything else to to comment on on, on that final point? No, just I hate that we have to wait a week. <laughs> yeah, me too. Why, why can't I just skip ahead a, like a couple of days and say, yay, it's Wednesday again? This is my favourite part of doing weekly shows. I love this. I, I love when there's cliffhangers that we only have to wait seven days for because uh, it's all going to be over pretty soon. Only six episodes, guys. So all going to be over pretty soon. A um, couple of notes about the episode. We mentioned it before, just that reveal of the kind of uh, the holograms of all the, of some of the previous variants. Um, just like there's a frost giant Loki, which is the blue one that we see at the start. We see a Tour de France winning uh, Loki um, wearing his yellow shirt and and carrying his uh, his stat- his trophy. I presume that's what he's winning because that's the only one I can think of that gets the yellow jersey, right? Yeah, yeah I guess so. I think so um, we have a Hulk Loki, a, a Hulk variant Loki, one that uh, that obviously. Um, got hit by radiation and became a Hulk, uh, which yep. I thought was cool. That's something I'd love to see uh, in the TV show, of course. We may be seeing it in the future. 
We also got a Viking Loki, and that's the one that Mobius is saying, and my favorite, just as he's uh, about to shut down the hologram. So Viking Loki, the traditional version of Loki, of course. Um, there's also a bit of an odd one with, uh, with round, uh, sunglasses, still in his, still <laughs> yeah. in his Loki colors, still in his green, but looked really, really similar for me anyway to, uh, to Ben Kingsley's version of the Mandarin. Uh, if you remember Trevor from Iron Man 3, yeah. I wonder if that was just a little gag thrown in for the people that don't like Trevor from Iron Man 3, that actually it was just a variant of Loki uh, that was in there as uh, <laughs> as um, Trevor. Yeah. I, I took it as a 60s kind of mm-hmm. play on Loki. Um, but yeah, it could be that. they like Marvel is great for trolling their fans. They are. They love having the, fun. The, yeah, yeah, definitely. Fun. Sorry, yeah. not trolling. Trolling is a bad term, but yes. <laughs> um, I obviously just adored these quick shots. Yeah. Uh, and I hope we get more of them, which is like him just circling through, going like in the next point when they're in the office, is him going through a few more. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have like fish Loki when, or like, I don't know. Some other comical Garfield Loki, where he became <laughs> Garfield the cat for a while. I'm sure there are a lot of references there as well to the comic book versions of Loki that have been yes. there in time as well, but uh, was too quick to pick them all, uh, unfortunately. Uh, one other one I just wanted to quickly shout out again, because we did see it in our feedback um, uh, section from Michael Booth, uh, one of our wonderful fellow defenders, who pointed out uh, the TVA logo, if you look at it, upside down spells the word Val, as in potentially... Val- Contessa Valentina Allegra de la Fontaine, who we last saw in Falcon the Winter Soldier. Could Val be involved in the TVA? And we kind of laughed going, um, we didn't see it, TVA upside down. If you type out that word TVA and look at it upside down, it doesn't look anything like Val. Absolutely, in this episode, you see Loki looking at files with the stamp of TVA on them, and they're upside down, and it looks really like Val. Uh, check it out. It's a very visual one, a uh, very visual uh, Easter egg for you, but check it out, p- particularly in that scene when Loki's sitting down with loads of files all around him. It really does look like Val is typed on there. This is where the font type matters. Or the Fontaine type yes. matters, John. There you go. There you go. That is it confirmed. Val is a, a lizard Timekeeper. She might be. She yeah. You never know. Absolutely. Or is she? God, you might Or is she? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but with that, let's get on to our defense. Chris, do you defend episode two? Very much so. This, for me, it's a great continuation of what was done, um, continuing with the explanation of how the time variance, the multiverse, the, the craziness works. Um, I think they, they've done enough now that this is going they they are they're on a roll they have essentially revealed their their master plan to a degree within the second episode and so the, i know there has to be way more to it but i like where they're going i like what they're doing i like the storytelling um aspects of it and i'm here for it very much so i i'm interested to see how the pacing continues cuz to be fair there was there was a small bit of up and down in this episode in a good way. They, they gave us breaks from the kind of the, the, the intellectual narrative dumps, um, with other kind of more comedic elements. I'm interested to see how that pacing continues from a story point over the next four episodes. They have proven so far with this cast, with the crew, with the writing style that so far in the first two hours, it works. Is that sustainable? Um, so yeah, I very much defend. Derek, do you defend this episode of Loki? Very good. I absolutely defend this episode. Yeah, I really enjoyed this episode. I know we have mentioned it before. We did actually get to see this episode uh, last week, just after we watched the first one. So we're really lucky in the fact that we were able to watch them within a couple of days. And I think that's probably why you're a bit more worried that you have a bit of time to wait, Chris, because you're actually waiting almost two weeks between the yeah. second episode and the third one. But um, it was such a blast seeing this episode because the first one was quite heavy on exposition. Second one, while there is exposition in it, having that moment where effectively this sacred timeline is being exploded by the end of the second episode was really shocking. And the yeah. reveal of the variant yeah. Loki was really shocking. We thought that those two things could be kept till much later in the season. So uh, so what are they going to deliver us for the next four episodes? Will it just be Loki versus Loki across time and space? Will that be the, the way, like, you know, the Doctor and Doctor Who and the Master, um, which went on for many, many decades on Doctor Who? So uh, is that what is that the way they're going to 
uh, play the show out over the next couple of episodes. It's really interesting and really exciting to, to set it up this way. So uh, I really like this episode. Great stuff. John, what did you think of Loki episode two, The Variant? Yeah, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And um, I'd give it four and a half salad bars out of five. Um, the reveal of Lady Loki, fantastic. The fact that you kind of have introduced the idea that maybe um, it could, in it, that Lady Loki in and of herself could be um, also controlled in some way. Ooh, nice little bit of intrigue there. Um, I think um, it was just really, really good. I, I loved it. And I, I, I love so many different sequences uh, in, in this episode, uh, in the rocks cart. I loved all the exchanges with Mobius and, and, and Loki. I just thought they were really like sort of pitch perfect for me. Uh, and the, the, the shifts in, in the various tones here, you know, um, where it's still exploring the timeline, mm -hmm. but it's also, as Chris has said, the different comedic elements being brought in here. Um, so this was all really good. I mean, it's, it's so intriguing. I mean, I guess when you're dealing with the, you know, it, the infinite amount of variations of time and space, um, I guess you could go mad, couldn't you really? Mm -hmm. And trying to think of, of which way it could go. So like this to me is just so, so good. So yeah, four and a half uh, canteen salad bars out of five. I love it. I love it. Uh, just call out the set design for the show as well. The, oh, the special effects for the show. The Vesuvius explosion that's going on looks really realistic and kind of like the, not in the same league, but kind of like the Guardians of the Galaxy one where there's a massive sci-fi special effects extravaganza going on in the background. Here we've got Mount Vesuvius blowing up very far in the distance. Uh, so you're not getting, uh, not, not, it's not the focal point of, of the show. It's kind of something that Marvel are able to do with kind of the budget they have and the yeah. expertise they have where they're able to do things like an apocalypse event going on in, in 2050 as well. Um, which, which looks really realistic and, is probably massively expensive. It only gets about three or four seconds of screen time. Um, you know, they, I love how much quality and how much, uh, is being shown on screen. The really great design and, and really great, uh, behind the scenes stuff, uh, that's going on as well. Agreed. Very much agreed. But gentlemen, with that note, there's a beer smell in the air. That can only mean one thing. It's time to go down to the pub. For good old fashioned pub quiz. It really is. Yes, fellow defenders, fellow quizzers, uh, grab yourself a tankard for some of that ancient Asgardian ale. Uh, indulge in some of those Asgardian treats of fruit and nuts, um, by the bar, uh, and enjoy question two of the defenders pub quiz. So, question two, when was the Kablooey chewing gum sold? I kind of thought that was going to be the question since you didn't call out the years. In I the, certainly in didn't. <laughs> we have a reference point, but you didn't call out the, the years that it was sold. So, Exactly. Yeah, very, very specific question. So, John, give it one more time. Yeah, the question for episode two is when was the Kablooey chewing gum sold? Mm -hmm. In which period of time? Excellent, excellent. So two questions given so far. There'll be four more questions to go, obviously, for the six episodes of Loki. Uh, gather all six questions together. Email us to feedback at TV Podcast Industries, and you'll be in with a chance of winning some Loki goodies at the end of our uh, coverage of, uh, of Loki. So, yeah, good luck, fellow defenders with the pub quiz. Uh, keep those answers flying in. Guys, I think we're on to feedback. First up is some email feedback. Remember, you can send in all your thoughts, theories, questions, comments, you name it, to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Uh, our first email is from Frederick, who had some thoughts on episode one. He says, hey, good old defenders. One, I don't think that the hooded mystery man is a Loki variant. I didn't think along the lines of it being a Loki variant at all. And the reveal that it supposedly was, was made way too nonchalantly. That reveal should have been a gut punch. Ergo, I don't believe this is the real reveal. And if it really was Loki in the hood, why not show us at the end? Yeah, I think we kind of said the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so 
uh, for sure. I guess now with episode two, we're fully aware of, you know, the, the Loki variant here in, in Lady Loki. So uh, I, I guess that explains why they kept uh, the figure hooded uh, in, in episode one. And um, Frederick goes on to say, and number two, I do believe that the TVA wrongly believes that the hooded troublemaker is a Loki variant. Why else would they enlist the help of Loki, of all people, to solve the problem? Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for your great deliberations, Frederick. Yeah, thanks so much, Frederick. I think on your second point as well, I guess that feeds into what you're saying, Derek, mm-hmm. that we discussed um in, in for this episode uh, about potentially yes it's got the physical form of loki it could actually be lady loki but it is not controlled by her own consciousness something like it that, is yeah. someone else or maybe someone taking that um that form yeah but at least the TVA believe it's a Loki variant is, uh, is, is the point that's uh, that's a really good point frederick thanks so much for your email um we also got an email in from jerry he has some feedback on episode 1 and 2 uh, he says, hey, guys, this show is a great think piece on the concept of time itself. First off, the TVA is itself. Is it in the quantum realm? The question is, how far in the future is it? Uh, we will soon learn why Lady Loki exists and why she is so pissed off. I think the next phase of the MCU is in the mul- is, is the multiversal war. Pym particle technology is the cornerstone of the TVA. So how important is the Ant-Man movie going to be in the future? Tom Hiddleston is killing it on this show. Uh, do you guys think there will be a season two of Loki to wrap this storyline two or three years from now down the line from Jerry and Niceville? Uh, that's an interesting question. There's been rumors of all of the shows. There's been rumors that Loki is the one that did already get a season two, that they are possibly filming on Loki. But uh, I have heard that those rumors were confused uh, by the fact that there was some uh, finishing uh, being done on Loki season one. So as you mentioned earlier on, director of the show, Kate Heron has only just returned from her final uh, edits on episodes five and six of Loki this season. So it would seem likely that those film, the filming that was being done more recently was the end of this series. So will there be a season two of Loki? It's possible. Um, but I think the only way this Loki can stay alive is if he's returned to the timeline exactly where he left off in 2012. Um, to take over from the old Loki, and then we have that Loki. Can we have a variant Loki walking around in the universe? Will it be a completely different story where he gets this, as you say, story gets resolved in three or four years after the movies have taken their run at the multiversal war? That's really interesting, really interesting possibility. Yeah. Yeah. If the Loki goes back, the Loki dies uh, In the as a variant. He comes back to the point of time where he left, and he then goes along pretty much the same channel that we've seen the last Loki. So dies in Ragnarok. Or, sorry, dies at the hands of Thanos. Or else they just stick him on the ship in Ragnarok. And yeah, <laughs> he just gets, exactly. gets an escape ship and he runs away. Yeah, but I, I think as well... Um, to your point about Doctor Who, it could go on forever, mm-hmm. um, dare I say it. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know uh, the pin particle being a cornerstone of, um, or the cornerstone technology of the TVA. I don't think it's been called it in the show that pin particles, and Jerry's saying that that's his guess, that the TVA are running on pin particles, or similar technology anyway, to go to yeah. travel through time. No, that makes sense, absolutely, for the travel through time Um and size change as well, um, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, just because, yeah, I think it feels like, you know, you've referring it to the Ant-Man movie. Um, I, I guess the Ant-Man movies, their importance um, is bigger than I think sometimes the movies, the Ant-Man movies themselves suggest. And I think, um, you know, this potentially has makes them even more sort of keystone to a lot now of these new developments to to the the MCU so yeah it's uh, it's really um yeah i i like the the pin particle notion i wonder if we will get it uh, sort of called out directly in this never forget if ant-man and the wasp hadn't happened Ant-Man wouldn't have been where he was. Exactly. He wouldn't have been able to come back and the world wouldn't have been saved from Thanos. Exactly. He's the the fundamental reason why the world was saved, even though the movie may not be one of the more essential MCU movies. Yes. And we do know that number three is Quantum Mania. It is all about the quantum universe and et cetera. In terms of your final question about uh, the, the multiversal war as being kind of the next phase as I kind of were talking about previously, uh, myself and Derek had a, an in-depth discussion about this. I am very much on this. I think 
that is exactly where we are going. The next big setup will be time. We do know Kang the Conqueror is coming in. We do, uh, we know now we have the TVA. We have the multiverse just being described. We have multi, the multiverse of madness. There's a lot of threads there. So I do think we are leading towards the secret wars. Um, or an aspect of that uh, going through in the future, where you bring together multiversal multitudes of heroes and villains, and we see a great multiversal war that is a secret to the world. So yeah, secret wars, yeah, secret wars, secret wars is coming. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Long way of going. Right. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, as always, great to hear from you. Next up, we're head on over to Facebook where we have some feedback from Heather Wallace. He goes, I admit I struggled to follow what was happening in this episode, but I had had my Pfizer jab earlier today, so I'm woolly headed just now. I'll watch it again when the side effects have worn off. Uh, side note, congrats, Heather. Good to hear. Keep going and hopefully you're feeling a bit better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're two thirds vaccinated here in the, uh, in the, um, booth, uh, or one third because, uh, two of six vaccinations. There you go. Yes. So, yes. So we're close. So we're on the path. Uh, delighted for you, Heather. Yes. Congrats. Heather went on to say, I did like Mobius saying, sometimes you want to play a different part. It's a great call out to Owen Wilson taking a very different role. Interesting. <laughs> Hearing holding out for a hero made me laugh. There was a YouTube edit back in the day of Ragnarok Bridge Fight set to that song that achieved a minor celebrity for a bit. I wonder if that's what inspired the director of this episode. The edit features Loki. Excellent hair flip. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I remember that one. Uh, Heather closed up by saying, I'm really enjoying your commentary, lads. Along with the show, it's the highlight of my week. Thank you so much, Heather. Really Thanks, appreciate Heather. it. Glad you, we are giving you a highlight each week so far. Yeah, thanks so much, Heather. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, think the hair flip of Loki is pretty good, actually. Along with his big Ches- Cheshire cat grin, mm-hmm. I guess. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Holding Ever Hero, I don't know what it is about this week. The trailer for uh, the new He Man uh, animated <laughs> yeah. show was cut to it. Um, the one from uh, from Kevin Smith. Um, the, this episode of Loki has it included in it. And I think the new trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy, um, the uh, the video game that's coming out in October, uh, is cut to Holding Ever Hero as well. So um, they're definitely making their money off that song this week. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> suddenly bought the rights, but this week is uh, is getting a lot of use. It's a massive song. I've heard it from, yeah. from I, when I, it was released. You know, I, I guess week. it's like Kablooey. They've only got it for a certain time. They must. Um, <laughs> and then they're going to do it. But yeah, thanks so much, Heather. Um, also, Donald Dennis over on Facebook says, This series seems to be flying along. I thought we'd get to at least the last half of the series before time bombs went off. I also loved the apocalypse loophole as a concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely with you there, Donald, uh, about the, the loophole um, and using the apocalypse. Uh, what's not like? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely um, putting a lot of the stuff, I guess, that... You know, we had initially thought would come at episode three or four and a bit further into the story that they've got anyway. And before whether even with the variant Loki, uh, let alone this um, sort of blanket bombing of time uh, reset charges. Um, So, yeah, I guess it's a bit like Apocalypse now. Uh, Potentially. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> potentially a, a time bomb apocalypse now over multiple uh possibly thousands of years uh we don't know yeah with chaos going. and madness secrecy wars uh you name it it's going to be epic i do love the smell of time napalm in the morning <laughs> that's the right film isn't it there you go it's a, it's a time variant version. That's all I'll say. I wonder if their radio host says "Good morning, TVA" in in, its, in their best <laughs> Robin Williams uh, voice. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe they've got a variant of Robin Williams there to do it. Oh, that would be great. Lucky, lucky people. Uh, thanks so much for that, Donald. Uh, we also have a voicemail in from Brandy. Hi, it's Brandy Elise Anderson, and I just wanted to share a theory that I've had since episode one and get you guys' input on it. 
Now, I believe that the timekeepers are set in a distant future and that the sacred timeline, and yes, I did use air quotes on that, is actually just the timeline that leads to them being in power. And they don't want those branches of other timelines, which could result in someone who could overthrow them. And that's why they want to keep this one sacred. Now, having that belief, I started to wonder, what if the multiversal war that they're speaking of actually did not happen in our past, but it's the multiverse of madness and everything that's happening in the MCU now, which is their past. So I wanted to know how you guys felt about that. Um, watching episode two, I was a little bit afraid that it might completely blow my theory out of the water, but I don't think it does. Let me know. Thank you guys. Glad that we're back from the MCU. Thanks so much, Braddy. Yeah, I think we're pretty aligned uh, on our theories about what's happening there at the multiverse. That sounds, uh, sounds similar to what we were talking about um, last episode on our on our feedback episode. And went into yeah. a little bit more depth uh, on the feedback episode. This idea that um, that it could possibly not be as far in the future as we think, um, and that these three aliens could be having this sacred timeline. For their own gain, effectively. It's keep everything this way. Make sure the world, uh, all of the things that are happening in the world stay exactly the same as we want them to happen. And then we'll get to our power place, I suppose, at some point in the future when all of these variants are knocked out. I think that's uh, that's a really good theory, Bounty. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, great to get your thoughts through uh, on voicemail, Brandy. Thanks, Brandy. Yeah, pretty much agreement thinking that their sacred timeline allows them to get there. The big multiversal war was their past, our future, or the MCU's future, very much could be what we're coming up to guessing. Um, I I do also think there's a lot more about the the TVA that we get to know. Mm-hmm. Like it, it it's going to be. I thought that there's a lot of other films. I think the best one, Wizard of Oz. Don't look behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. Um, the smoke and mirrors. It's going to be very much that I think, which yeah. is don't look behind the TVA, um, the curtain of the TVA and the space lizards. Because even that mention with Mobius, someone that looks like he's been there his entire life and is an older gentleman, um, he says he's never ever met the timekeepers. Um, yep. that he's never had any interaction with them. So, uh, yeah, you could be right there with the uh, Wizard of Oz analogy. Yeah, thanks so much, Brandy. Yeah, definitely into uh, the theory that you mentioned about the multiversal war uh, and, and the multiversal madness as well, linking in there. And I, I to be honest, I, I hadn't really, I mean, we, we'd said about the TVA being kind of maybe a bit, you know, shady um, in, in the last episode, but I, I like the, the theory that you have around the timekeeper's power play. Uh, it's ultimately a, a self-preservation, self-glorification type way of keeping them sort of uh, at the top of the food chain, I guess, in mm-hmm. that sense. So yeah, great stuff. Thanks so much, Brandy. Excellent. Thanks everybody for all your feedback. We love getting your feedback in. Please uh, keep sharing it. By email to us at feedback at TV Podcast Industries or popping over to the group on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash TV Podcast Industries. And you can join us there where we put up spoiler posts for all the shows we cover uh, on each of our podcasts. So thanks so much, fellow defenders, for joining us. Remember, we'll be back later this week to discuss all things Star Wars The Bad Batch with Episode Mm 8. And we will be back uh, next week um, with the third episode of Loki. Um, And as always, any feedback on any of the episodes so far is great to get your thoughts uh, on this great series so Mm -hmm. far. Two halfway points we're reaching this week, episode eight of uh, of The Bad Batch and episode three of Loki. (laughs) (laughs) It's timed. It's timed. (laughs) Must be, must be. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate your time, your listen, and your patronage. Speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks again, fellow defenders. Uh, great to have you on board. As always, it's a pleasure discussing things, all things Loki with you. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep defending. For all time. Always. Bye. Bye. Bye.